A single bad wire can be the difference between winning a robotics match and sitting dead on the field. You never want to do that because you're putting stress and strain on those soldering joints. This video is going to give you the skills to find and fix the most common wiring issues before they ever have a chance to cost you a win. I'm Coach Pratt, and after more than a decade of teaching robotics and design, and having coached national champion and Inspire Award winning FTC teams, I've seen these simple electrical mistakes sideline even the most incredible robots. The information in today's video was shared with me by a mentor in Colorado who has a PhD in electrical engineering, and they wanted to get these critical lessons out to a wider audience, so a huge shout out to them for sharing this with me and with you. In the next few minutes, I'm going to run you through exactly what to look for. We'll cover broken solder joints, loose connectors, bent pins, and hidden wire breaks. I'll show you how to spot them, how to fix them for good, and how to prevent them from ever happening again. Now, before we get into the main meat and potatoes, I got to send a, uh, another shout out to the mentor from Colorado who has their PhD in electrical engineering, which is where a lot of the information comes from for this video today. I am continuously impressed and super proud to be part of this kind of robotics community and just how open and sharing mentors are to uh, try and develop the next range of engineers. So thanks again for sharing this information. So let's start by taking a look at some of the most common ways that myself and this mentor have seen that wiring tends to go wrong on the robots. And I'll try to talk about some of the reasons as to why these mistakes might end up happening. So a really common one is on these little yellow connectors. It's called XT30s. And you end up with broken solder joints. Uh, this is really common when you're using your switch and you're trying to plug this thing into your control hub and you end up snapping one of these solder joints. These XT30s are really quite horrendous for snapping off. And the biggest reason that this happens, so if we take a connector and we add these connections together, too many students would disconnect this by pulling from the wires. You never want to do that because you're putting stress and strain on those soldering joints. Instead, you want to pull from those yellow connectors and then decompress it from the connectors themselves. That's going to give you the most likelihood of your solder joints not breaking off. Another way of reducing that pressure is using this Expansion Hub XT30 support. Uh, this is a 3D model from user My Evil Twin, and you can grab this, add it in to give yourself a little bit of support on the XT30 connector so you can take a little bit of strain off of that as well. I'd even go further and suggest you take a zip tie and you zap strap this section right about here so that you end up without that cable strain. You're constraining that cable nice and close to the joint and the actual connection, but you're not adding strain to that cable. I'll have a link to that in the description down below. By the way, if you and your team are finding value in this content, it really help us out if you can give the channel a like and a subscribe. It really helps the channel grow and helps me reach more teams like you. Another way that things go wrong, surprise, surprise, is another XT30 connector, is bent connector pins uh, or compressed connector pins. And I'm talking about compressed connector pins right off of the Rev website or the Rev website. You've got pins that are kind of smushed together so that you don't get as much uh, connection or contact points. Uh, this is a really common thing that can happen with XT30 connectors, and typically it happens when someone's trying to put something in on an angle or wrenching off the cable or not wrenching up straight up. Uh, another reason it happens is just too many connections. These XT30s are really fallible, and they don't last very long. My suggestion would be to plug in your power switch once, get it constrained in, constrain your power switch by another zip tie so that you're not putting any flex on that cable, and then don't move that thing for the rest of the season. Because the more times you're stressing this, the less likely you are to have a reliable connection. If you do have something that has broken, I've got a video down below, uh, linked in and how you can kind of fix that and add in some different connectors called an Anderson power pool so you can make these things a little bit more reliable. Another common one, this one isn't so much a wiring problem as it is just a wiring mistake. So servos connected backwards. Oftentimes you may have connectors with yellow, red, brown uh, going into white, red, black and just not making sure that you are connecting these things properly. Yellow, orange and white are typically your signal cables. Red is almost always going to be your power cable and then black or brown are going to be your neutral or your ground in this. So make sure you're connecting these things properly. Something that can happen with these servos you can have loose pins or connections on these. 
And again, that comes from grabbing those wires and tugging on those wires instead of grabbing from the servo connection itself. These little connectors, they're called DuPont connectors, they're not the strongest things in the world. Yeah, they're just tiny, small little pieces of aluminum. And then these little plastic retainer clips are probably about 1.1, 1.2 millimeters thick. They're really, really thin. So it's really easy for you to stress these connectors. Another one happens if you build your own servo connector cables and you're not paying attention to having the latch go the right way, you can definitely have these things pop out. And I'd suggest you either do a recrimp or get a new DuPont connector so this can happen. One of the bigger things that you can use actually on these loose pin connections is using a servo clip. And we'll talk more about that later. Another big issue, of course, is wire damage. If you have any cuts in your uh, vinyl sheathing on your wires, you have to make sure that you cover those up either with some electrical tape, with some heat shrink wrap, or consider replacing the wire itself, depending on where it is on your system. Biggest way that this can happen is not being careful with your cable management. Sometimes you can add a zip tie that is too tight. And if you add something too tight, you actually compress those and you actually start cutting into those wires. Sometimes teams fly too close to the sun. And when they're making their rotating arms, they're not adding enough stretch. You can actually disconnect these. Or there's pinch points, especially near moving parts like gears, near arm joints, and other things like that on your linkages, on your linear slides, these are really common ways that you can get wire damage. And the problem with that is it can be really challenging to find where the problem lies and how you can solve that. So always wrapping your wires and making sure you have them consist, making sure you have them constrained in some sort of cable sheathing. I really like that wire wrap sheathing can really help protect those. If you're looking for a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to uh, wire a robot, I've got a link in the description down below of a full step-by-step -step where I take an entire competition robot and I wire it all up and you can see some of my favorite tips for routing your wires. When it comes to that sheathing, this uh, wire cord protector is effectively just a sheet of plastic that is wrapped around or these spiral cables. I prefer this cord protector. This can really help protect your wires so that they don't get pinched because it's a, it's a little bit wider has less like for you to pinch the wires inside of this section. Now, servo extension cables, it's really common that a servo wire is not long enough to be able to reach your actual intended purpose. The less connections you can have, the better. So you can buy servo extension cables in 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, all up to about 80 or 90 centimeters. My suggestion and preference is that you use one cable and one extension. I would not daisy chain connections together. Because the more connections you have in a system, the more points of failure you have. So if you can go from servo to a single servo extension cable and then directly into either the expansion hub or the control hub, you are on the right track. If you are going from extension cable to 30 centimeter extension cable to 30 centimeter extension cable to 30 centimeter extension cable, you are just asking for more points of failure. Any time you put a servo together, I suggest you use a servo extension cable. Uh, you can buy these online, but if you have access to a 3D printer, you can really easily 3D print these yourself. Uh, I've got a model here that I've been using uh, for my server extensions for a long time. I find this works really well. But again, sometimes uh, server extension cables all come in slightly different sizes and flavors. Uh, for the vendors that I use, this one works really well. If it does not, I've also included the step file inside here so you can download this and edit yourself in your own CAD software. And what these do is it is a, a small, slim way to keep those connectors together. So if there's any sort of strain, it just holds them together and it makes life a lot simpler. They come in different flavors. It doesn't really matter the size you use, honestly, just that this is a great place to make sure your wires stay together. Let's talk a little bit about soldering versus crimping. From our mentors' advice, wherever possible, solder wires and crimp your connectors. So for instance, if you need to connect two motor cables or make a motor extension cable, if you can add in some solder joints and then a little bit of heat shrink wrap, this will be okay. The problem with solder joints is that solder joints can be a little bit brittle. Yes, they're very hard, but you can end up breaking the wire at the joint itself. The solder itself is likely not going to break, but the wire that is attached to that solder might which is another reason why those XT30 connectors are not great because it uses a soldered connection as opposed to a crimped connection. 
And again, why I suggest you move over to an Anderson power pole. If you can, a crimped connector is better because you have less concentration of stress. You have that ability for them to be able to move a little bit, uh, deal with those vibration stresses, and especially in robotics, you are dealing with a lot of vibration stresses. It'll make your life a lot smoother, a lot simpler. If you are using your own sensors, in which case making your own limit switches, be it a magnetic limit switch or a little contact micro switch like this, I suggest that you use crimps for these. You can add some little crimps here, a little spade connector, and some heat shrink wrap. That'll hold it on very securely, and that thing won't be coming off all season. There's also no need to really buy these yourself, at least from a specific water supplier, because they're super, super easy to make your own normally connected or normally open limit switches. If you want to make your own servo connections, you should definitely get yourself a ratcheting tool, and it's actually pretty easy to be able to create your own DuPont connectors. Just make sure you're using that ratcheting tool and that you leave your correctly crimped contact so that you don't do that latching section itself. And our mentor here has a fantastic uh, slide here on doing so. You can, if you need to, make your own custom lengths for the JST connectors for your I2C, your digital analog. I do not suggest it, and neither does the mentor. Reason being is that as you are adding more solder joints, again, you have more points of failure. Also, these really tiny JST pH connectors are real small and trying to make sure you crimp these things properly is just a challenge. If you're not experienced with it, it's kind of like crimping off an Ethernet or an RJ45 jack. It is just not easy if you're not trained to do it properly. As much as you would think it doesn't seem all that challenging, you really don't want something falling off mid-match. So my suggestion would still be buy a factory-made cable for the correct length. And the reason being, honestly, these cables are so cheap that by the time you buy the correct JST connectors, you buy all the wire and you buy the actual crimp, the ratcheting crimp tool to be able to do these connectors, you really haven't saved much money anyways. So I wouldn't recommend it personally. So those are the most common ways that I see wiring go wrong in FTC robotics. Uh, if you think I missed something or you know there's other common ways, let us know in the comments down below and we will and that can help out the rest of the community as well. Uh, thanks again to the mentor for sharing out this awesome information on electrical wiring. I know wiring can seem a little bit boring, but the reality is if you don't have a strong foundation for your robot, neither your builders nor your programs can do anything if a wire severs itself or gets contacted with some sort of ESD event. So I hope you found this useful and best of luck out there this season.